from the unceded land of the Lenape people, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to Lenape people and elders and ancestors past, present, and future. On behalf of the new museum, I'm glad to welcome you to tonight's panel conversation entitled On Faith, Artist on Faith Ringold's Influence. This program is in conjunction with the exhibition Faith Ringold, American People, co-curated by my colleague uh, Gary Carrion Murayari, Kraus Family Curator, and myself. Leron Brooks will moderate tonight's conversation, which features panelists Dietrich Brackens, Tomashi Jackson, and Shabalala Self. Programs like this are core to the new museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. I would particularly like to thank uh, Andrew Westover, the Keith Haring Director of Education and Public Engagement, who is not here today, but is getting his PhD is, uh, at his graduation ceremony, so, as well as the Education and Public Engagement staff members, Andrea Calderisi and Derek Wright, as well as the entire new museum team for their help bringing this program uh, to fruition. The new museum public programs are generously supported by the Bowery Council, and digital initiatives are supported by Hermine and David Heller. We also thank our members and supporters who, like you, help make these programs possible. I will share now some short bios on the participants, unless anybody's already bored by my introduction. <laughs> we have a terrific lineup, so I'm glad you are all here tonight, both on the stage and in the audience. And it's really an amazing honor and a privilege and a pleasure to introduce the guests tonight, who obviously are brought here together by the power of uh, the great Faith Ringel that has uh, gathered so many friends and admirers throughout these past months. So in uh, rigorous alphabetical order, uh, Dietrich Brackens is a weaver and a poet who has exhibited at the New Museum in 2019. He constructs intric intricately woven textiles that speak to the complexities of black art and queer identity identities in the United States. Recent exhibitions include Heaven, in a muddy riverbed at the Craft Contemporary Los Angeles, uh, at the Craft Contemporary in Los Angeles. Um, as I mentioned, in 2019, he was featured at the New Museum in a solo exhibition, which eventually traveled also to the Blanton Museum. He won the Wien Prize and uh, the Marciano Foundation Artadia Award, and he was a 2021 USA Artist Fellow. Um, I'll continue with the notes, which clearly I'm uh, reading in random order. Uh, Tomashi Jackson is a multimedia artist uh, working across painting, video, textile, and sculpture. Uh, she's based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and New York. Uh, she has exhibited uh, quite uh, prominently in many great museums across the country, and uh, uh, particularly um, her work has been seen at the 2019 uh, Whitney Biennial, at the Parish Museum, at the Wexter, and uh, Emma Smoka. Uh, she is also shown at the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston, and uh, she was also part of uh, Black Women uh, Artists for Black Lives Matter that was convening here uh, during a Simon Lee uh, residency. Um, I forgot in which year, but um, maybe 2017. I. Um, and then uh, Shabalala Self, uh, who is a painter who lives uh, and works in New York, uh, in the um, tri-state area of New York. Self is uh, also a friend, I dare to say, of the New Museum, where she has exhibited in the exhibition Trigger in uh, uh, 2017. And she's also been a tremendous supporter of Faith's uh, exhibition, uh, literally making it possible with her generosity and support. She has exhibited also in many um, important museums across the country, most recently also at uh, the ICA uh, in uh, Boston, at the Baltimore Museum, and uh, um, I'm now mixing up all the notes. <laughs> and uh, uh, she's, her work is also featured and included in the collections of the Brooklyn Museum and the Guggenheim Museum and the Whitney Museum. Finally, uh, Liron Brooks, who is the associate curator for modern and contemporary collections at the Getty Research Institute in LA. Uh, Liron and Shabalala and Dietrich have also all contributed to the catalog for the Faith Ringgold um, exhibition and they have all contributed really beautiful, touching and, and personal um, essays. Uh, Brooks is specialized in African-American art, poetics, performance and Africana studies. 
His work has been published and featured in uh, many publications, uh, published by a variety of museums, and including the Studio Museum, well, now the New Museum, uh, Socrates Culture Park, uh, the um, International Review of African American Art, and uh, uh, many other uh, distinguished publications. So really a terrific lineup, and I'll just hand it over to Leron and enjoy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Master Miliano. So before we begin the presentations, I just want to acknowledge uh, what's going on in Texas. And I just want to, you know, be in solidarity with, with everyone there in, in terms of, you know, um, what we can do to better our future. And, and I think coming to uh, occasions like this, in terms that we get to discuss not just art, but what art means and who we are in this particular moment, because that's really a power of what art can do for us. You know, the three artists here I have the highest respect for, and it's an honor to, to moderate this. And, and, you know, hopefully we can, um, we can think seriously and also we can laugh and, and just be here and be present and sort of be in this particular moment. Um, <coughs> on to another important thing. Um, Java, you want to go first? <laughs> the only one said no good. Presentation. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, this is Dej it's Diedrich's work right now, so I don't know. Diedrich, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's gonna be. Your <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can. That would be really cool. If you talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to go for it. That's fine. Um, so I picked a couple, maybe five slides to think about my work's connection faith, so what um, important lessons I've learned and carried through you know, faith's work. Um, so the first image here is called Stud Double, and it's a work I made in 2019. And I was, I have for a while really thought about um, dogs as a way to think about state violence, um, about the police, about the military. <coughs> I think a lot about Tapestry's connection to the hunt um, and trying to think about this um, through a contemporary lens, thinking about who and what is hunted and by and who. Um, and so this is Blessed Are the Mosquitoes. I can see the reflection. I'm pretty sure that's what I'm looking at. Um, and um, I made this work in 2020 and was at that time making works to think about um, the ongoing and historical ramifications of the AIDS crisis. Um, and there is a CDC t statistic from 2016 that I'm gonna um, abbreviate, but it said that within their lifetimes, to use the CDC language, men who have sex with men, um, one in two black men who have sex with men would um, contract the virus. So I made a series of weavings thinking about this idea um, also this work, Fire Makes Some Dragons, um, uh, was a part of that same series of works. I was really trying to channel this imagery to think through um, what that meant and trying to find these ways to think about healing and rage. Um, and um, I, I think often using this silhouette, which is uh, comes directly from my own body, um, which I think a lot about being in conversation with Faith, someone who um, is so lovingly and obsessively uh, inserts herself into her work in, as a way to think about um, any number of ideas and uh, historical events. Um, I don't know what this is called. Uh, <laughs> Through the Eye Unburnt and Blameless. Uh, I made this in 2020. And I had spent a lot of time thinking about uh, my hometown, about Texas. Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful to have um, this place to look at and be inspired by and make work about, um, as I believe Faith is, about Harlem, like I am about Texas. Like it is so important to me to think about this, um, this rural, place that I'm from and all of these histories that have occurred there. Um, so at the time I was really thinking about 
2020 and about 1924 and about how um, we were in another time of fire and um, fires being set to um, property and places. Um, and in 1924, there were sort of this, these mirrors of each other where across the country there were these race riots and thinking about how these, these histories were sort of mirroring each other um, and the like presence of fire to, to be that kind of instigating um, natural force. Um, Um, I made this work last year, and it was a part of an exhibition at Jack Shaman Gallery um, titled Rhyming Positions, and something that I think is, um, for myself, palpable in the work is grief. Um, it sort of is an undercurrent in a lot of the work. Um, and I think about a couple of Faith's works that think about the loss of um, familial folks like her mother and grandmother, um, the way that she can sort of oscillate between rage and grief and love and um, all these sort of huge uh, emotional registers in her work and how uh, it, it feels important to me to be able to access all of those things um, as well. I think that was the last I mentioned mine. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Hi. Um, thanks again, everyone, for coming. Wow. Look at this. Um, so I chose five pieces. Uh, again, we were we were asked to think about our work and and its relationship with uh, Faith's oeuvre. Um, the last minute, I remembered that I had this piece that was really important to me, and it also was a collaboration with Shaba when we were in school together. So this is called "Girls Just Want to Have Fun," which we just heard on the street, Connie. Um, <laughs> Girls just want to have fun. Uh, Pavan for a dead princess. Um, this was this 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 was a, uh, an outcome of um, an ecosystem. I was trying to create a, a a world in the studio and looking at Faith's show upstairs. There are there are specific moments when she invites us to consider the quilt as a performance, um, the quilt as personal as a, a, a personal narrative of um, interiority and a performance. Um, and in this case, I was trying to turn a painting into a print, into a video, which we did successfully, and then for the outcome to be this tangible photographic print that's a still from the video. I knitted this for Shaba to merge with her skin and uh, to merge her with this image of Ayanna Stanley Jones, uh, who had been murdered by uh, police in Detroit, and her murderer was eventually set free after three unsuccessful trials during which her grandmother was forced to testify over and over again about what they did when they burst into their home with a no-knock warrant into the wrong house. And um, so I was asking questions about innocence. So there's Shaba, innocence and black womanhood, black girlhood. So Shaba's face is uh, obscured by color, merged with Ayana's face. And in the backdrop, there are these images from the NAACP Legal and Educational Defense Funds um, sociological research um, that was a part of the Brown v. Board of Education cases. One of the battleground cases was um, in Delaware. These are second graders from Delaware. So that's that. We should keep going. That's probably my five minutes. Um, uh, this is Interstate Love Song um, from my first uh, solo museum show at Zuckerman State University, uh, no, the Zuckerman Museum at Kennesaw State University. Um, uh, so again, you know, what is the quilt? Can the quilt be a performance? I've wondered for a long time, being a student down the street at Cooper Union, um, are these awnings paintings? Um, is the awning a structure for a painting? Um, is this protrusion uh, from existing architecture that alters light um, and protects people, um, has the potential for protection? Can it be something else? 
Can It Be a Print? Um, my printmaking teacher's here too, Dave Gleason's here. So this is, this is a carryover from collecting strips from the um, unused strips from the waste bins on the fifth floor and using them. Um, the images come from the Georgia State University archives um, and from the public domain, images of people protesting against the expansion of public transportation and for the expansion of public transportation from the 1980s to as, most, as recent as 2014. Um, yeah, we should go to the next one, yeah. Um, and there's something happening with light projection, right? So like, what is a painting? Some people would say painting is a window, uh, painting is color, light is color. Um, anyways, so uh, this is, this is, uh, shoot. This is, help me, Connie, Megan, can somebody help me with this title? <laughs> It's just escaping me right now. But this is from my most recent, this is my most recent show, uh, The Land Claim at the Parish Museum. Um, this is Kelly Dennis and her cousins. Among heirs. Among heirs, thank you, hallelujah. Among heirs, uh, merging images uh, um, uh, from a personal family archive and the Eastville Historical Society. Um, there's just a lot there, but the, the, so I think a lot about faith and I think about her, her ability to think about herself and the world beyond herself, communities beyond herself, and I, I attempt this um, while merging all these different layers and ways, the, bringing the outside in. Um, and we'll go to the last one. I think there's one more. Um, actually, no, there was. Okay, so anyways, this is the current show. This is my current show that's up at uh, the Newberger Museum of Art at SUNY Purchase. It's called Slow Jams. Um, are these videos paintings? Um, and can, uh, can, a, can a painting space be immersive and literally uh, moving? Um, on the left is, a, is another collaboration that happened when we were all at school together. That's Alteron Scumby wrapped in um, knitted color study that I made, um, merging us with the painting space um, in the studio, um, trying to resolve my feelings about what was happening in Ferguson at the time. Um, using the painting to, uh, to, to hold recorded video. And then, and then this other image is um, called Head Over Heels, my cousin's playing in a, in a yard in Los Angeles in 2015, 14, um, merging them with printed images of uh, children from segregated classroom documentation from the NAACP. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm knitting these color studies and I'm wondering, is this color study a sculpture? If I turn it into a video and project it large and, and make it monumental, can it function as a sculpture? Um, and I think, is that it? Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this painting was actually most recently shown in it was most recently shown um, significantly in my ICA Boston show, which was titled Out of Body. And um, this work is significant to me because it was kind of the beginning of a new series where I started examining um, the domestic space as being a potential site for my figures. Um, in general, my figures have existed within this liminal space that I've articulated with color fields. Um, but in the recent years, I think post doing one series in which I really dedicated myself to an environment, that environment being the bodega, I've been curious and I've been interested in investigating other environments. Um, the bodega was an interior space but was public. And then after that, I did a series of works that um, looked at the street, and the street, I think, is a significant um, site in regard to art um, from the neighborhood that I'm from. I'm from Harlem, and a lot of artwork from the Harlem Renaissance deals with the street as a site, and I think similarly, um, Faith Rangel is an artist within that trajectory that's also dealt with the street as a site, thinking about how much of life and that part of the city is kind of, you, you, you so much of the life takes place life of interactions, quotidian interactions take place on the street. Um, so the street, even though it is a public space, in some ways it has this interiority to it. If you think about a neighborhood and how people interact in the street in that kind of metropolitan space. Um, 
And I think that relates to like larger ideas around identity, especially if you think about how black identity functions within metropolitan spaces. So the street was the second environment that I kind of touched on. And, and now more recently, I'm, I'm in the home, which is a private space, but interior. So kind of just dealing with all these ideas of interiority, exteriority, and how that affects, um, how that intersects with identity. Um, and within these interior, like domestic spaces, I usually, it's usually these couples or couplings that I'm um, interrogating. So this is another work that was done in the same year, but later on, but again, it's investigating the, the domestic space as a site. This work is, I think, most literally inspired by Faith Ringgold because I'm giving homage to Tar Beach, just in the, like, the left hand corner of this work with this, you know, my depiction of the George Washington Bridge. Um, I'm kind of imagining that this is a home in Harlem, an apartment, this kind of post-war New York City apartment, hardwood floors, old plaster walls, old window, and from there you can see like the George Washington Bridge. And the previous work was called SPAT, which kind of shows a more contentious relationship between two individuals, whereas this one I, I find to be far more like romantic and loving and kind of showing a, a different kind of dynamic, but again, investigating um, interaction between a couple. Um, this work was made in 20, well, sorry, the, the previous work was made in 2020. And I was really in, interested that year in how um, black identity politics were kind of playing out within the realm of blackness in regard to um, people's expectations um, for black individuals' opinions about the election. Um, that only came up because this figure, I decided to put into like Yeezy sneakers only because um, as, I, <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, my partner is a big Kanye West fan. So I've been hearing about these sneakers throughout the whole entire quarantine. So um, <laughs> I just started drawing them almost, I don't know, just because this is in my subconscious, I suppose. And then um, I also at the same time w had this, you know, fascination with Spreewell, like this re, this new fascination with Spreewell, and I had this fantasy where kind of both Spreewell and Kanye West for different reasons represented this concept, concept of like a rogue Negro, like a black person that's like misbehaving or behaving in a way that's unexpected. <laughs> so <laughs> I kind of wanted to conflate them in this one work. Um, and that's only was significant to me because of the year it was made, this thinking, having so much anxiety too about my show that was opening in November of 2020 and wondering like what was gonna happen <laughs> um, that when, when everything you know, was gonna happen that week. So that's kind of the backstory behind this work. And this is a more recent work. I believe I made this work in 2021. It's called Sisters. I wanted to include this work in the presentation because for me this work is, again, it's about kind of this quotidian black life, like interactions, interpersonal reaction, um, interactions, relationships between individuals and their loved ones, those close to them. Um, and this work to me feels very nostalgic and I felt like I often feel that kind of sentiment when engaging with Ringgold's work. Um, so I, this, is a, this is one of the reasons I wanted to include this work. Also, this work is, kind of, is an odd work in terms of the whole pantheon of all the characters and figures I've made because I think this is one of two or three times I, I depicted a child in my paintings. And just knowing, um, you know, Ringgold's relationship to children and her desire to want to encourage artistic development in children having been a professor and also her commitment to creating art that was accessible to children. Um, you know, me and myself, the, I interacted with her work the very first time through her children's books before I was aware of her as a fine artist. So it's, you know, this is another reason I wanted to include this one particular work in the presentation. Thank you. I want to bring Faith uh, into the space, uh, just through her words, if I can. I just want to give you a quote. You can't wait around for someone to tell you who you are. You need to write it and paint it and do it. That's where the art comes from. It's a visual image of who you are. Unquote. And with each particular series of you explaining your work, I mean, I feel like you, you are telling us 
who you are. You know, you know, Diedrich, I mean, the vulnerability there, putting yourself inside of that space, you know, of, of, of speculation. But it's not speculation as in this, this is not real. You were talking about things that had a real effect. And it's disproportionately on the black community as well. But you were talking about things that affected millions of people's lives and who you are in that space, right? And you're, you're, you're telling us who you are, and that's, and that's brave. To be to be in that space, you know. I just want to say thank you for that, you know. Uh, Tamashi, you know, the, the, you actually use archives, <laughs> you know. I mean, she I mean she goes and she's a researcher underneath the abstraction. And so just just take take a real look. I mean, it's basically original research she's doing through through paintings in, in a certain kind of way. So. You know, just that, just the vulnerability of going into history to these really kind of traumatic moments in African American history, especially, and to deal with the kind of figures, you know, who who, who paid the price for for their for their uh, protest, and to pull out of that, you know, narratives that talk about you know gentrification, that talk about you know real world things that happen in black communities, and think about space the way you do, right? I mean, that takes a real dedication, and you are telling us who you are, and that's brilliant in as well, right? You know, in Shaba, just the the the, inti the interiors there, right? That sort of domesticity, but it's not do domesticity as in something that's static, right? It's it's about these relationships and taking, you know, just thinking about, you know, the relationship of the work you j you just showed to to what Faith was doing. It was really it was really um, outside of work to a certain degree because no one was looking for a brilliant black woman like she was to do the kind of work about black people like she was, and from a black woman's perspective. Right? And so, you know, one thing we should forget about Faith is that she was out there. You know, much of what she did was without acclaim because she chose to dedicate her work and her life to being a black woman, but showing the, the, the complete life, the domesticity. To, and so to be in that particular tradition is still a brave one. Right? And the way that you, the way that you do it, even, you know, you surprise yourself. You saw the child and you surprise yourself. I mean, right? So inside the work, you are, you are surprising your, your, yourself, you know? And I think, you know, um, and I think that's really, really, really powerful. You know, for myself, I studied with uh, Michelle Wallace, Faith's daughter, and I spent a lot of time, you know, with, with Michelle and, and thinking about Faith and uh, just knowing them personally. I mean, hardcore, man. <laughs> you, know, you know, because because they had to survive during a moment in which they were being attacked. They had to survive during, during moments in which their work was being undervalue their work, Michelle's work as an intellectual, first work as a painter intellectual. I mean, so we're talking about, I mean, I mean, thank you, Massimiliano, for, for this show, because you're giving us a chance to see Faith's work from floor to floor. You know, you're giving us a chance to see someone who's dedicated their lives, and you're dealing with artists here who are dedicating their lives in the tradition, but also making their own tradition at the same time, you know. So, do you remember a time that, that the first time you actually maybe heard Faith speak or, or that the first thing, the first thing that, 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 that got you, you know, you know Deirdre, you know, the, the figure, and then, you know, you also did work with, um, with African American symbols, right, in terms of quilt symbols and, and, and that kind of thing. And so you see in Faith's work, you, you have a lot of uh, applique, right? You have a lot of um, design, the, the, those design elements. And so, but you are putting yourself in there as a sort of speculative figure that that form. Right? I mean, do, do you see that as a communication between you and Faith, or do you see that as, cu as communication to something larger? Um, so I studied textiles in undergrad and in my graduate education, and so um, I'm just getting nervous. Like, I don't know if this is recorded, but I'm also like, even if these people, folks are listening, it's all true. Um, <laughs> so the textile department was within the larger visual art college, but um, it was like one big building where all the art um, happened, and then way over here was the, the like textile building. So both literally and um, physically, and I think conceptually, we were so outside of the bounds of what other folks were talking and thinking about. And so a lot of the sort of uh, initial ways that I was taught were about like finding what your inspiration was going to be, what sort of textile tradition were you going to study, and it was myself and maybe like 40 white women 
of many different ages. And so the there was always this impulse that people were like, you're going to study quilting, aren't you? That's going to be your like textile tradition. You're going to like look at these things and these things. And at first I was like, damn, like why are they like trying to read me? But also I was like, <laughs> I am. <laughs> um, and I think being in the South, being in Texas, like there was for me already, like I knew that there was this like, um, source that I could put my finger on and it was still alive and there were people around me who were practicing it. So I think um, a lot of the first contemporary artists, and I, I think most black artists have this moment or artists of color where you're like sitting at a computer and you're like all the um, markers for myself plus artists. So I'm like black artists, like African-American art. And I think quickly you stumble upon Faith's work and so for me, it was like, oh, there is a person living who's making things using the materials that I'm learning with. Um, and so it was a very early moment where I was like, okay, I can, it can be something to the left of quilting. Like I don't have to sit down and like stitch and um, make a literal um, quilt, but I can sort of borrow those aesthetics. And I think it was the first person who like really started to show me what it was to be worldly and find inspiration and in all these other things. Because I think as much as her work is about quilting, she's like looked at all these other textile traditions. So it was one of the first ways where I was like, yes, I'm black and quilting is sort of like in the source code, but they're like everything else can be mine as well. And I feel like I really started to learn that lesson there. Yeah, that was great, the source code. Yeah. Yeah, but Shaba, do 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 you do you see a source code in in Faith's work, a, a DNA source? Um, I would say that I'm like more. I I definitely identify a lot with how her work is made, like a lot of the formal qualities. Um, using unconventional materials, using textiles. I feel like I was drawn to approaching my paintings, um, in the way that I do with the sewing. Um, for similar reasons that were some of her initial concerns that had to do with like practicality, her relationship of her body to the scale of the work she, she was making, kind of being able to make these fine war uh, marks at a certain intimate scale, um, and how when working with the machine, especially a sewing machine, you're able to kind of have that relationship to the art object or to the painting plane. Um, so those are, on a formal level, I identify with a lot of the concerns of the work as well conceptually, but I think the thing that really stands out to me with Faith is just her um, her narrative. I think it parallels so, so much my own personal narrative, so that's what really fascinates me with her as, a, as an artist. And the fact that she's living and still working is also truly inspiring, because I feel like a lot of the artists that you're made aware of initially when you're beginning your journey as a young black artist are um, artists that weren't able to age or weren't able to survive a lot of the issues that were, a lot of the pressure that was placed on them. So to even to see an artist that has survived all these different moments in her career and has fought against um, people's attempts to, I guess, sabotage or oppress her, but didn't, didn't fight in a reactionary way, just fought for her own, to like stand her own ground almost. I feel like that's mostly what's been inspiring about her as an individual for me. And, and before, uh, Tomasi, before I get to you, you know, there, there is maybe, it's okay, so maybe the, uh, the idea of DNA in faith, but there's also the deep well of artists and culture that, that may run in many of our families, right? The, the quilt makers, the seamstresses, the, the you, you know, so not necessarily considering themselves artists, but they're making things that we now make art with, right? And traditions in our families that can embolden us, even though they weren't fine artists, but learning how to sew learning how to do the different things, applique and you know, all that stuff to make, a, to make a quilt or what have you, and pulling from that to then enter faith, right? To, to enter fine art, but you know, maybe there's, there's something common you know, amongst our uh, families or you know, our fam maybe our, your family's on the, it, but, it'll, but also communicates through faith who, who actually took it to the fine art space by which you can see both, right? The artisan culture, but also how this enters fine art, which has to do a lot with faith's, faith's work, challenging modernism, right? using modernism's tools, but understanding modernism's histories by putting, you know, Van Gogh in a painting, not to say I own you, but not, not to say <laughs> I don't own you, right? 
So, you know, Tomasi, you know, is there anything like in terms of, you know, in terms of faith, like the DNA, like, like, you, like a source code in her work, you feel that, that you can have a little bit, you know, but then take it into your own particular space? Um, I always come back to um, the paintings, like mm. the fact of the paintings, the texture of the paintings, and um, uh, for the women's house. This is the one that, um, this was the first piece of hers that I saw in real life as a student here in New York. Um, and uh, it affirmed me and my thinking because I was, um, I come from California. I was born in Texas too, so we think that we actually might be cousins. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna figure that out over dinner. Um, but um, I come from California, so um, my first interactions with painting that were um, shaping for me were through muralism and being dwarfed by painting in the built environment, monument, monumental paintings of um, people of the city that I grew up in. And I grew up in mid-city, so Roderick Sykes and Roderick Sykes and Noniola BC, the Spark murals, uh, Judith Baca, um, and then as a, as, a, as a young art school dropout, um, I studied muralism in Northern California with Juana Alicia and Susan Cervantes and Presida Eyes Mural, so muralists. And um, so when I saw this on the, on the East Coast, where the way we learn about art history is very, very different from the way we all learn, we all cut our teeth in California, this was extremely important and affirming to me to learn the story of this piece, um, that she made it for the women of Rikers Island with the women of Rikers Island, um, that it stayed there and was eventually whitewashed. It was so devalued without her Without, without even speaking with her, that it was whitewashed and it was through a personal relationship um, uh, with a guard uh, that, that let her know that it was happening and it was saved and it was uh, restored. You know, like this addressing issues of public concern through the painting, um, fine. And then, and then of course there's the, there's the publications, there's the, there's the pedagogy, there's the public organizing. All of that um, affirms parts of me that I just can't seem to change. So I appreciate that about her. Mm -hmm. It, it's almost like, you know, she had to be many people. And it's almost like, you know, we, we each to, today have to be many people. But some of those people that she was got out in the street and protested as well, you know? Well, I have trouble saying, um, I have trouble saying that, the, that the sh her, her strategic methodologies were not reactionary. They were proactive. They were um, engaged. They, they're obviously in the documentation that we can see and the fact that she's living and speak for herself, it was through, through, through relatedness. Um, uh, you know, like I love that the quilt is asked to be a performance, not the demonstrations. That's, you know, you know like that's, uh, that, that all of this real work can happen inside of, inside of one artist and with the expectation that the only way it works is through us as community being engaged and being responsible with and for each other. So, um, when I got here to go to school, I felt like there was a lot of emphasis on the white cube among my peers. Um, and I come from a very public art oriented space. So she's someone who merged these spaces for me in a museum and brought the outside inside um, and so much more. It was really important. Yeah. And it, you know, just, just thinking about the outside, you know, that this way in which, you know, black emotionality, black humanity can be on the outside, but even today, you know, what, what dominant cultures, this dominant culture, right, considers to be worthy of a true narrative, right? I'm waiting for a Love Jones too. When, when is that gonna happen, you know? <laughs> it ain't gonna happen, <laughs> it's too much. It's too much, it's just, I guess that's an inside joke, right? So, <laughs> but no, so there's a, but there's a way in which, you know, things that, that deal with um, black interiority are on the outside of what the culture wants to represent as something that's real and worthy and, and in live again. So you now we think about what's happening in the world and we think about, okay, here, how can we think about artists who are actually in a tradition of bringing a certain kind of interiority? You know, because you know, inside the white cube, and also outside, but inside the white cube, there is that one-to-one -one relation. You see faith painting, well, faith painted faith <laughs> inside some of those Pictures and some of them are melancholy, but you know, some of them, you know, she's dealing with distress. She's dealing until so they're very autobiographical. And so what does that say to, to you as viewers when you one-on-one -on -one, you get to confront that? Do you reject that? Do you want to invest in her humanity? Like what is she dealing with in this? Okay, what's the context she she's providing for us to see something that's going on inside of her? 
right? And so this is really the challenge. And so we think about what's happening in the world. This relationship is what makes us human because we get to see someone express their humanity to us. And so with visual art, what does it take for you as viewers, right? What does it take for, for you as artists to sort of see that there, there's a middle ground, but what you're doing is actually humanizing, right? What you're doing is actually allowing people the chance to be invested in not only what well, we say faith's life, but even these larger things, you know? Just in terms of, you know, the vulnerability that comes with, you know, being considered to be on the outside in terms of who you are, Didrick, right? Or, or, but by society trying to tell you who you are. And you're declaring that in these, you know, in these works, I am searching, but I am also me. Right? Do you want to get into like the, the idea of that the figures floating in space or the idea of the figures not having features? You know, sometimes when I look at Jacob Lawrence's work, I think that they, they, they are abstractions that happen to be figures. Right? Like you look at them and it's like, oh, he kind of just walked into that, but that wasn't really like a figure figure. Like, <laughs> like you know, some of them, but, but, your, but yours also, they, they have that quality, but they, but they also have a, uh, something else that just speaks to something deeper I can't describe right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, hmm, I actually, this like brings me back around to faith in a long way. And I think there's so many moments that I'm still unpacking about how faith has um, impacted my work. And so I think about the figures being in relationship to a long line of um, artists who have depicted or figured black folks through um, the color black. So I think about Kara James Marshall or someone like Kara Walker, who Faith was very critical of. And so um, to me, I think I've like learned from Faith and like um, um, learned against Faith in some ways. Like I think she has like helped me sharpen my own idea of like um, how to articulate um, sensitively and particularly like what it is to um, to experience the world as a black person and so th that, that's part of it um, but I think for me I've um, found myself using the silhouette or the shadow um, both as a vehicle for my own dreaming to happen but um, to insist on like a grounding in um, blackness through this sort of like legacy and lineage of makers and creators who've used the silhouette or um, kind of like pitch blackness uh, to communicate and I think even in a lot of Faith's paintings um, her insistence on not using white for instance in a lot of those um, uh, the Mm, I don't remember what period those paintings are, but of her parents, um, I think even the Rikers painting maybe doesn't have any white in it. The that cover image uh, there actually on the face of that book you have, not that one, just on the front cover, like no white paint. So I think like using these strategies of like insisting on blackness to to depict blackness um, is a is a big part of it for me, um, and I think working in the medium of, of weaving, there is a um, inherent abstraction involved that I'm always sort of like pushing against. So sort of try to like pull that figure out just, just enough. Um, yeah. Just enough. Just enough. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you begin with mono prints, right? And you and you build up off that 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 form, and you 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 choose where to emphasize certain parts of of the body, right? And th those particular choices, I'm thinking of like bearding, right? Very specific choices to sort of have parts be foreshortened, just just come out and and but but they have just personality, you know? They have a, a sense of somebodyness. You know, I'm, I'm really, really amazed like how you just, th those particular choices you make in terms of, of, of what, understanding the body and how to position the body that the character is, is, is very, very, very present. <laughs> you know, could you, uh, like, how do you do that? <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> um, well, 
I do think about maybe how a figure is experienced as opposed to how it exists in reality. So I think about like if you're interacting with a person, um, especially for someone like me who I think is, you know, I'm kind of obsessed with figuration. So when you're talking to someone, you're not just seeing all of their whole form and equal, you're not giving the same amount of attention to every aspect of that person as like a corporal figure. So maybe you're focusing on their eye or you're focusing on something that's a lash on their cheek or you're looking at their hand or their nails or some aspect of their form. And when I'm making the work, I'm exaggerating different aspects of the body that I imagine um, someone who would be in the same space as this figure, this imagining this pictorial space as being a real environment, if they were interacting with that person, um, how would they experience that person as opposed to how does that person actually sit and you know exist in this world that I'm creating? So that, that accounts for a lot of the exaggeration. Um, when people interact with the work, they, I think, read different symbology into the exaggeration a lot. And they're not entirely wrong. It, it is some of the exaggerations deal with cultural tropes, but it's not entirely one or the other. It really has to do with my understanding or my imagining how someone would interact with, uh, with the individual who was sitting in front of them. Can, can we possibly pull up an image? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one of Shaba's works. Can we actually pull up an image? So Tamashi, like, so, so what's interesting too, too <coughs> is that you have whole color systems that, that go with the, the figuration, right? The print on the bottom, right? Yeah, so. Um, so, in this work, I would say that there isn't so much exaggeration, but there is this more like a flattening of the form, which is something that I do in a lot of my works. Um, what stands out to me that's most interesting about how this work is composed is that um, the figures, especially you look at the legs of both the, of both the figures, they're, they're comprised almost entirely of scrap. And um, I usually have, in my studio, I have like large bins of material. And I'm often just pulling, sometimes aimlessly, from the material and sewing it together to just start to begin to work on a piece. And I, I think that's similar to like the practice of like automatic drawing, which is something that surrealists believe in. And that for me, I think that it achieves that goal of like accessing this aspect of your subconscious and kind of allowing the work to form on its own. Um, from there, I see what direction I feel like these forms are, are turning into. So allowing it to travel from abstraction to some figuration. And then I start to build a body from there. Um, but Originally, I was attracted to this way of working just out of almost instinct, but it became to have a significant um, meaning in my work and kind of reinforcing a belief that I had that, or I have, that you know, individual is a sum of many parts. So um, experiences, accumulation of experiences, memories, um, things that are inherent to them, but also things that they pick up along the, the way, things that they pick up throughout the course of their lifetime. So, so we are walking applique. <laughs> I mean, that's actually, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, some of us, after this, we may have added something, you know. <laughs> you know. So, Tamashi, can, can we have a, 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 an image of uh, Tamashi's work, please? So, the, the color, so, so, the color system on top of the print figuration, and some of you working here is the video, right? And so you get to see, okay, system of color and meaning on top of the figuration. And so the, the, the images are archival images, meaning that these are situations that have had a, a meaning just in terms of um, history. And then the color system melded in, not just on top of, the color system added to that. You know, I mean, I mean for me, that, that, that's, that's, that's not easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's not easy to do. I mean, as a matter of fact, I think I, I have a quote. I have a quote from you. I have a quote. Uh -oh. uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Be it through figuration or abstraction, our public narrative is embedded in all that we do. I said that. Yeah, you said that. You said that. <laughs> said that. It was in this video, you know, right. ten minutes in. Da, 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 you know. Okay. But but you know, and so and so, there's a way in which you have both those elements, right? You have the abstraction and then you have the realism. But be it either or those images sort of say, this is, this is also the concrete thing. 
right, to a certain to a certain degree. If I'm misreading it, just let me know. But those images bring us to a historical moment, historical situation, and figures, right, that that are sort of enhanced or, or given a certain kind of viewpoint through the kind of color system that you apply to them. Okay. Am I wrong? Um, well, uh, I appreciate um, I appreciate a lot of what um, um, my fellow discussants have shared about um, their processes and um, what's particularly standing, what's standing out for me is um, intuition um, and uh, letting a work um, emerge uh, for itself. Um, and for, like my, my best position is at the mercy of the work and the research. And um, um, my best friend is a, was an education researcher when I was in art school and um, I learned from her that we don't, you do the research, you don't actually know what the outcome is going to be, right. and it's not it's not your business to determine the outcome. It's just it's just to ask the questions and to dig. So, um, and then like uh, as a painter, I get to then um, watch for um, you know itchiness or you know like ooh that one, you know that's that's the one. So when I saw this image of Kelly Dennis and her cousins, they're uh, Shinnecock people. They are the they they are descendants of the First Nations people who did not leave. And who were who somehow were not forced onto the Trail of Tears, um, and they're still fighting for their land now, and they're actually purchasing back their land through the Nyamuk Land Trust. It's incredible, incredible history is being made right now, and um, so I saw that picture of them on Instagram, and she let me use it, and uh, and then there's this other image of uh, black bathers on Azarest Azarest Beach, um, still black owned private beach. Um, on Long Island, um, what what is help me, Sag Harbor. Thank you. Um, and uh, so uh, the half tone line is what's hap is what's really activating everything here. So I'm still always asking questions about the relationship between printmaking and painting and sculpture. Um, and I don't particularly trust myself to always know what to do with the the figure. Um, anyways, that's I'm getting too personal. So the color system. The color system is really determined by the materials that are the base of the surface. And so I, I collected these materials from uh, fabric shops um, in Sag Harbor um, and around. Just I drove up and down uh, Long Island uh, um, and through, the, through what we call the Hamptons, but what the Shinnecock people know is the land of the heart. And um, I met people and I found materials and that begins like the, the structure of the, of the surface. Um, and then it turned out to be a beach, which was confirmed when um, a Shinnecock attorney, Tila Troge, came and kidnapped me from the studio at Watermill and took me to um, an extension of their reservation, which meets the water where I had never been and would not be able to go on my own. And uh, she took me through this thicket of trees and I saw this vista at sunset and it looked like what was happening with that painting. I didn't, I didn't understand what was happening with the painting, but. I kind of try to make it my business to respond to the shape of the thing as it emerges and find the geometry within it. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm just a worker among workers in that way. And then as it emerges, I just, um, I don't know, I just do what I'm supposed to do. And I just know that, I just knew that that image needed to be for that painting and it was confirmed by the landscape itself when I got taken to it. Thank you. Sorry, I just wanted to. <laughs> no, no, no. no. I'm feeling like I'm in a little bit of and church how they, here. And how these histories collide, right? So uh -huh, I mean, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll just, I'll keep, I just want to read this from Faith um, oh, about uh, the women's house painting. Mm -hmm. She said, the superintendent of the women's house of detention on Rikers Island in New York was very receptive and gave me an opportunity to talk with some of the women inmates about what they would like to see depicted in a mural. One woman said, uh, one, one, one woman said she would like to see a long road leading out of there and another spoke about women of all races holding hands and having a better life. So I had spent a lot of time focusing on, um, you know, faith addresses a lot, like in Die and the flag is bleeding, um, all of this state and vigilante violence that we're at the mercy of at the, at the moment, or historically, you know, all of this begins in violence and blood. Um, and with this project, I was kind of like urged in my conversations with the people um, to focus on their power. So I turned away from, you know, I wondered, wondered sometimes what will the research say if, if the focus is love and self-possession. Mm -hmm. 
um, and not just being at the mercy of white supremacist violence. And so what ended up happening were these, these things. Thank you, and, and that really is the, the power of, of what art can, can do, and that is challenge the, these overriding systems of oppression, even when you're saying you're making work to ask a question and not even have an answer, right? Which I actually think is powerful because you guys spend a lot of time in your studios. Right, and studio work is a lot of private work, and so to go on these journeys and say, I'm not gonna have an answer, I still have, I'm making a question, right? And then to see that question live in the world and have an impact, and, and, and uh, I think that's just a very powerful practice thing to, uh, thing to do. I just wanna thank you guys for that. Um, I think we have time for questions. You guys up for questions? Okay. Any questions? Hello, my name is Tanil Mack, and I just want to say thank you all so much for being here. Hi, Dr. Brooks. <laughs> How you doing? And my question is in regards to um, the essence of creation, and like while you're in your flow state, at what moment do you ever feel yourself pull back, and how do you stop that moment from happening? Thank you for the question. Um, I, all the time, the pullback part, all the time, I'm like, I have been talking for like three to five weeks. I don't even know how long about lobsters, not lobsters, excuse me, crabs and oysters and like lighthouses. And like it, sometimes people are talking to me about something and I'm like, do you know that <laughs> the, the name the Latin name for blue crab means savory, beautiful swimmer. And then I'm like, why am I telling this person this? <laughs> like, what's going on? Um, and like, g genuinely, I am doing research <laughs> about these things. But for me, it's like, I often start with like, some animal, some animal. And I'm like, four weeks, t learning every fact I can about it. Um, uh, but for me, I'm always trying to like, tease out these relationships between this undesirable, unredeemable, um, maligned animal and like uh, this this sort of thing that I feel like has happened historically um, in tropes about black folks and so I'm always trying to use these things to like lift one to lift the other um, and trying to think about the ways that like we have ex coexisted with those creatures consume those creatures um, raise them been afraid of them um, to like tease out this deeper deeper thing um, and so like in, in one way that's like the work is that I'm like, I'm just trying to get to know this thing so I can tell you why it's like you, you know, like, which is so silly. Um, but like really like sitting in that discomfort. And I think the other thing that I've learned about art practice is that work does not always look like work. And so when I am in that like uncontrollable, unhinged, like I need to like just put my feet in the river just for a second, like I'm just, just do it or like, I'm going to lay on the floor for the, the studio and like look at a book or spiral. <laughs> but like that that is like part of the work and I need like I have to trust um, especially when I unchain the commercial aspects of work from the work. It's like you, you know the trip to the place, the the rest, the um, reading, you know half of 16 poetry books, like all of that stuff is going to somehow lead me back. Um, and I think even getting to the place where I can claim that I'm a weaver and a poet, like that is a long time coming. So I think sometimes um, you don't get out of it, you like go through it. Like I, it took me so many years to like get to a place where I was like, I write, I'm a writer, I'm a poet. Um, and I think that that's just honest, you know, to like, I, I would imagine like the four of us probably have projects that are still like being put off and put off and put off. Uh, but in the midst of it, I'm like, I'm still doing the work. Like I will get to the place where that other thing finally like comes to the surface. When I'm usually working on something and I feel the need to pull back, I think it's because um, 
That was something maybe that you touched on earlier. Maybe if you're feeling like you're too exposed or too vulnerable in that moment. And I, I, most artists are always anticipating like sharing their work with an audience. So then knowing that at some point other people are interact with this body of work or this image. And at that point, if you share this truth, then they will know this truth about you. So I think that's usually what that fear is coming from, or that desire to like um, kind of recoil into yourself. But um, I actually got pretty good advice about this issue in graduate school. Um, one of my teachers said to just put that thought out of your mind, that the fear that someone will know something about you or attest to you as an individual based on your work. And I've just kind of exercised that um, in the studio. I try to be almost in like psychologically, I try to be almost like in a meditative state when I'm making work. So just pushing those kind of thoughts out of my mind, but also other thoughts, like you said, not concerning yourself with all the commercial noise around the work. Um, any other concern is kind of almost allowing your mind to be clear so they can be filled with your own true thoughts, not these kind of fears and anxieties that are kind of creeping in. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I, I, uh, when I feel um, uh, there's like uh, anxiety or, or upset, my internal drugstore of like worry and stress and fear and insecurity, um, there was one painting from the Land Claim show that really put me in my place that was um, um, among protectors. Um, and I'm, I'm like, I'm having this experience, things are looking good. Um, the movement in the painting is letting me know what colors need to be printed on vinyl to interact with it. I think I understand what's going on, and I just overdo it and impose myself. I'm washing and washing and washing. Like, I like that. I like that. So I'm going to do it some more. I wash, I wash, I wash. I like that. A little bit more. And then hours go by, and I've completely lost what I was able to see that was so beautiful about it. And so then I have to stop and uh, try not to hate myself as I try to go to sleep and then come back and, um, you know, pray. <laughs> and like pray for atonement and um, try to do what the painting needs me to do, not what I, you know, so like I've, I've run into those moments. So I'm like, okay, this is me imposing me onto this. And all of these paintings have their own purpose in life. They, they have their, 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 their unique personalities and um, I have to be sensitive to what their needs are and not impose my own. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting because, you know, sometimes you, you may work because you have a, a need, a psychological need to be repetitive, mm -hmm. right? And that need may, quote, unquote, damage your idea of what the work should be, right? And I think, right? But then when you know, like, like selfishly, I guess, really, like, oh, I, I just went too far, like, because, you know, maybe you had a stressful day. I mean, who knows, right? But sometimes you need something and then... Sometimes something just looks good. I mean, painting feels good. It's like it's a it's a delicious thing to do. And um, uh, making I don't, I wish I would really like to apprentice for you sometime, Diedrich, because I don't know I couldn't tell I could don't know anything about weaving, but you know to make something with your hands, for people like us it just feels good. And um, and I like I like feeling good. <laughs> so Absolutely. sometimes if I'm looking at something or the texture of something feels good, I will keep going and keep going until it's like, okay, I'm like, are, have you had enough? You know, it's like it's talking back to me like, are you done? Because this isn't what I needed. So now come back and let's, you know, clean house and let's try this again, um, however long it takes. Thank you. Next question. Hello. Hi, hey, hello. Um, I'm Constance Patton. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to be in a room full of people right now. I'm just wanna, I just want to give you guys your props, like from one artist to another. It's been a real pleasure to see the work that was created during the <coughs> shutdown. I'm a muralist and an educator myself. I painted uh, like 60 of the plywood murals that you saw around the city. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. It was very uh, intense. You're welcome. It was a gift to you guys. I'm curious about your studio practice because I was outside, that was my studio was like, you know, kind of creating the backdrop to the protest. And I'm curious about uh, like how, how were you able to stay in your studio that long? Because I was like, the moment that, it was actually right, George Floyd was killed and then the, everything just exploded, we all had time for it. And so, um, you know, once we were able to kind of like be outside, and I knew that these artists were going to come down and paint. It was there were thousands of us. Um, you know, I was like not in my studio. I didn't go there for like 
a year and a half. So I'm curious about what that was like, what, what that particular isolation, knowing that as artists, I'm not sure about you, but I can be quite hermetic myself, you know? That's it, thanks. Um, I think that weaving is so inherently um, time-based in a way that like, to make a thing of a certain size requires a certain amount of time. Whereas like if I think about m most other like non-craft based disciplines, y you can be done with the thing when you decide. Whereas I'm like, there's a certain amount of length that has to happen. Like I can't just, <laughs> do no shade to painting or anything. All respect in the world, all respect in the world. My, my, my larger point is that I think I, I am predisposed to that kind of like process and like love of the labor and what I have found over time is um, oof, I don't actually even know how to say this but I, I think that there was a point in my life where I used the process to like uh, as therapy like to go sit in that place quietly and just like gnaw on that aggressive thought that I've been having or like um, you know, pick apart something that I've done. It's like, that's where I found resolution. Um, and that was like a safe space. And that's where, I, you know, everything that I needed to kind of work through, it's like, I got time. Like, <laughs> this is the place. And I think I have learned to actually pull back from that because I think it was a way to like avoid like dealing with my social relationships and um, taking care of myself, like, because I had to go to the studio. And so I, I think for me, the the balance of like it takes the time it takes and I want to go home at night and like see my people and spend time with my loved ones um, has been like a really hard balance to strike um, but like during the pandemic I was there there all the time and I think it was it was beautiful because I didn't have to make any like concessions or excuses like I could just disappear into the work um, and now it's so hard to come back to the <laughs> world. So I'm also happy to be sitting here in a room with like artists who I love and respect um, and, and just like sharing with y'all. That wasn't an answer. We might be cousins. <laughs> uh, um, during that time, during the pandemic, I spent most, a lot of time actually at home uh, well, my new home, I like, moved during that oh, time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I moved. Yeah, I had moved. And then um, the time that I wasn't where I like currently live, I was in my studio. I was in New Haven working. And for me, that felt like a place for me to be safe and to kind of work towards my own objectives um, in terms of kind of creating my own world for myself and a space where I felt already validated and uplifted instead of, I guess, going and, um, I, I just don't believe you can control other people's behavior or opinions about you. I think people are gonna believe whatever they want about you. There's no amount of convincing them otherwise. So um, i rather just create my own narrative and document of my life for, for myself and for people who can already identify with that. Uh, I feel like this is, I've always felt that's a more productive use of my time. and I went to school together. I got to be with her for a year and um, she was always dropping that wisdom because I would be wound up. She'd be like, Mashi, Mashi, I know there's so much you gotta do. I know there's so much you wanna do for the people, but keep it sexy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and you can't, and things like that, you know, like where where are you gonna invest yourself? I'm, I, uh, I come from a, uh, from a, history of tutelage around muralism from women. So thank you so much for the work that you and so many people did during that time. I was watching, I was in Cambridge, um, locked down with my um, best friend and I was making, um, uh, I was in exile from my studio um, in Sunset Park. And uh, I was working with my first ever research team and we transitioned our effort into a conversational effort, a documentarian effort that led to this book. So um, that, you know, we were interviewing people around uh, um, Brown 2, the case that I didn't know 
exist. You know, I didn't. I don't. I go into the research areas that I go into because I don't know stuff. So I didn't know that there was a 1955 implementation case after Brown v. Board of Education, and that Brown v. Board was multiple battle, battleground cases and the, the pre, all the cases that happened before the Supreme Court case. And so we had conversations with people in isolation over Zoom. And uh, my research assistant, Martha, or collaborator, Martha Schnee produced drawings, like live drawings while we talked to people. And, um, and, it, and, and then we, we, we edited that text, excerpted and edited that text to make this thing. Because, oh, the, what is our, archiv our, our archival impulse? That was our question then. We, were, um, we had access through Harvard Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. We had access to the archives of Polly Murray and Ruth Batson, um, uh, two uh, undersung trailblazers uh, who's, you know, just take those names and run with it. Um, we had access to their papers and to their pictures, and we thought, you know, what if we focused on this, this area of history through a lens of self-possession, love, and coalition? What would that look like? And so, um, and as opposed to like scenes of belligerent white supremacist violence against black children, which mesmerized me in a sickened in a sickened way when we were in school together, because I was like, I don't, I don't understand what we're, I don't understand what we're looking at. Uh, where children are, even children aren't a protected class. So. Um, yeah, we, were, we transitioned into another mode, um, asking what does an exhibition look like when people cannot gather safely? And our solution was the book. Um, but if I had been here in the city with you, I likely would have been hard pressed to keep <laughs> myself from you know, carrying paint for you, carrying your water. So yeah, we would just would have been working. So thank you so much for the work that you did. Thank you for the, thank you for the statement. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, I'm V. Um, my question is, especially for those who are deeply invested in research work, um, I know for me during lockdown, I was taking a, an American history course that was um, compounded with a um, diasporic black literature course. And so I was getting inundated with violence that really touched me very deeply because it was um, ancestral violence, you know, things that I felt very deeply because they'd happened to my ancestors. And so um, my question is like, when you're doing this work and doing the research and like diving into these um, spaces, how do you, like what does self care look like as an artist, as a researcher, as somebody who's also being asked to and asking of yourself to speak to these things and also like carry on that lineage. Mm. <laughs> We're do the waterfall. <laughs> uh, well, first, shout out to Tamashi's bag. I feel like it's the fifth panelist up here, like <laughs> every time. <laughs> it's doing the work. Um, I think that. What does self-care look like when you're doing this research? Um, so during the pandemic, took poetry classes, started running, like was doing all, like loved running during the pandemic. I haven't been doing it since. Um, <laughs> but I, I feel like I was finding out so much stuff with just about like myself, just through like that quiet time and like pushing myself to do all of these things that I had not done before. Um, but I think what happens so often is like the research starts over here and I for so long will be thinking like I was saying about an animal, um, something that has nothing to do with blackness or queerness on the face. And I don't know how this happens, um, but somewhere down the rabbit hole of research, it finds the connections come together. So I spent all this time thinking about catfish and was reading superstitions about catfish and then found this like gruesome story like uh, superstition in a particular part of the Appalachian Mountains where it was believed that like you could attract catfish and eels with human flesh and so there was this horrific story that involved black folks and I was just like I was just minding my business trying to like <laughs> fall in love with a catfish and now here we are and so I think I've always found that like my interest in like the, that core question like always come together, even if it's uh, if it takes forever, if it's circuitous, if it's tenuous. 
Um, and in those moments, I think it rattles me and angers me to my core that like I can't just be whimsical. Like I can't just be interested in the catfish without like facing violence. And um, and so for me, it is that like the the work needs to in some way address those things and talk about them. And I th- I think in my life like. Uh, there is the like leaving the studio behind. There is like getting into nature, and I and I think sometimes for me in particular, like the getting into nature, I feel like in this body, I'm like, I am gonna go out into those woods and never come back. <laughs> like something bad's gonna. Happen. But I think it's like, oh look, I came back. I came back. Like <laughs> it was great. I breathed some fresh air. I deserve to have that. Like this, this like floating rock is a part of my birthright in so many ways, and I should get to experience it. And so I think like confronting like physically and literally the world um, for joy, like brings me back to myself in a way that I, I think about like what it is to survive and be able to like seek pleasure uh, out in like real physical space. Um, yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, we, we don't recognize that the lockdown was something wholly unusual. It was such a disruption in terms of how we thought about ourselves. It was such a disruption in terms of how we spent our time. It was, it was such a disruption of us, us as social beings, right? To go in that kind of isolation uh, with the threat of this thing that, you know, we were wiping down uh, the groceries and, you know, all of that, right? Let us not forget that, right? And so it, it was, it was a, a whole moment in which people had to reorient take themselves to what it is that they did professionally, had to reorientate themselves to their friend life, their family life, and then the rise of Zoom, and then all this other stuff. And so, you know, you can go down some holes, some research holes, you know? You can definitely go down some research holes. Yeah. And, and like, to like be even clearer, it's like, I started running pre Ahmad Arbor. And so what was it, like, for me it was like, I just found this thing that like gave me such a release and now I'm like, you know, like there is a different weight you carry when you're like then trying to continue to go back out in the world. Uh, but like purely, truly, um, frankly, it was like reminding myself like what the payoff is if, you know, if I go and continue down the road of the thing that like, that, that does like heal, heal the body. Um, and like continuing to like be, you know, uh, alive in the sight of the ancestors. It's like, I deserve this, <laughs> this is my thing. And even if I um, have not, I don't think there's any earning, I guess is my point, like it's still mine. Like I should still have it um, in the face of folks trying to like restrict me or take those things away from me. Um, I mean, it, it was it was really a heck a heck of a moment, and you know, I, I think we all need to sort of look back and t- see what 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 flowered from that moment. Anyone still making bread? No. <laughs> but I know it's a little boy. It's a little boy. It's I, like a little boy. I started taking walks with my two best friends in Cambridge. Um, uh, we went for um, we called it Black Girls Breakfast and Walk. We just would go have breakfast and then we would walk for a while by the river and just talk and I'm lucky to have two best friends who were um, EDs so it was always like strategizing for leadership also low key Um, and with a couple of people in the room um, I won't tell all of our business but um, uh, I I have gotten to be a part of a burgeoning um, online community shout out to E. Jane and Chiquima who have been in online worlds of closeness and intimacy with people for a long time. I didn't know that that was going to be a space for me, but this this other thing happened during the lockdown where a lot of us were organizing ourselves in communities of care um, and uh, recovery and healing um, for BIPOC people to feel um, safe while other people were attacking the Capitol and um, or you know marching in the streets, Nazis marching in the streets, like all these all these nightmares that I had about what was going to happen. What was that? Twenty sixteen. I was like, oh, I, that's when I started um, stocking up my cupboards, actually, in 2016. Like, what, what am I going to need if we can't leave the house? Um, for if we, or if it's not safe for us to leave the house? You know, what if there are Nazis mar- marching in the street? And lo and behold. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a, I, I learned a lot about the possibility, the potential of intimacy and real growth among human beings um, 
if you have access to Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, Sandra Perry and I uh, co-taught co a class, again, with Martha Schnee for uh, Harvard uh, Art, um, Art, Film, and Visual Studies Department, exploring painting as time-based media. I was really mad that I wasn't going to get to teach at the Carpenter Center, and then it turned out it was extraordinary. You know, like what, th what we can do together if we organize ourselves, Faith has been telling us for years, um, as, as, as artists, like we're, uh, art history is not passive. Our participation is not, is not passive. Um, the worlds that we create for ourselves with intention, no matter what's going on outside, have the potential to be um, life-changing. Um, you know, I, I, during this time, I was writing the catalog essay for it, and when I concentrated on when, when Faith got arrested, <coughs> right? When she got arrested for during the flag show, and for me, during that particular moment, I, I guess, you know, with George Floyd and, and all that, that was happening, it was really important for people to get perspective on what was, was actually happening to people at one point who were speaking out against, you know, against the abuses of government, uh, against, 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 against abuses, right? And that at one particular point, you can get arrested, right? If, if you said something that desecrated the flag, if you painted something that desecrated the flag, if you made something, that some particular person in authority thought was desecrating a flag, there was a law in which you could be arrested. And so, you know, there's a way in which, you know, there's a way in which I saw faith as, as challenging the boundaries. And so there's the pandemic boundaries, but I saw her as challenging, the, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the racism, the institutional racism in terms of what museums were doing at the time, in terms of what policing was doing at the time, in terms of uh, government authority and at the time, all of those things she was challenging and she was in the street and she was in the studio, right? And so, and so, he, and so in this particular moment during, during lockup, you know, we, we had to really, in some particular way, find out how we can find meaning in the world, but also deal with what we were sort of going through emotionally, right? Friendship groups, um, relationships, all of that, that's all of that. And, you know, but some particular moment, we have to really just think about we're still here. Faith is still here, you know? Because we went through something, really did. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. All right. So I, I guess um, we we'll just just end it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.